you guys are obviously collaborators, right, working on this. But I'd like to start with that theme of this constant re-innovation in the UAE and then Dubai not having the blessing of the uh, hydrocarbon wealth. They've moved into trade, they've moved into tourism, they've moved into finance, now fintech, and obviously see a great deal of potential in artificial intelligence. And one of the things we wanted to focus on here is getting the mindset right, because uh, you know the debate around the world is it's going to destroy jobs and society won't be ready. Um, but if you do leverage it in the right way and apply it to certain sectors, uh, it can work. Do you want to jump in, Gavin, on the opportunity and what you're seeing, uh, the dialogue you're having here, and then we can drill into healthcare, for example, and how to scale. These are very directional mics, so we bring them down. Go ahead, Gavin. Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, for having me here and having Antonio and I here. Thank you, John, for moderating. I just say we've had a series of incredible meetings here focused on um, data center infrastructure. And the last time I was in the region was 2021. And I was personally blown away um, to learn that here in the UAE was developed an LLM called JICE, um, which is the world's largest um, and most sophisticated Arabic um, LLM. And it was also very interesting to me to learn that um, only 1% of all Arabic written work has been, is online. So the UAE um, used OCR to digitize this, um, all sorts of things that had never been online before and help train the model. And this is why it's most sophisticated. So I think there are amazing things happening here. And ultimately the cost of energy is gonna be one of the critical inputs to success in AI. So this region has every right to be a winner. Okay, do you wanna take it from there Antonio? Yes, I mean, I, again, I'd like to also echo uh, Gavin's gratitude for having us here. Thank you to our, our um, host here at the UAE. Um, look, every time I come here, I've come here several times now, I am struck by the depth and strength of the society itself. And this morning we were in a meeting and I, and I, I, said, to, I said to the person I was talking to, um, it feels these countries are run by uh, Plato's philosopher kings, people that really care about the society and want to do the right thing. Um, what this means in the context of artificial intelligence, it, it's very important because the models themselves are imbued with the values of their creators. Falcon, Chattis, as Gavin, as Gavin uh, discussed here, they, they will be view, imbued with the societal values of whoever builds them. And as we think about this in a competitive world between, call it the Chinese and, and America, we all have our value sets. Here in the UAE, you have a value set, I believe, it seems to me, that is what's right for the people. How do you develop your economy? How do you bring jobs, GDP? The models being built here will be very important and we can learn a lot from this in the US because they're focused on optimizing toward the overall benefit of the population. Very important. In America, they may be focused on optimizing toward profitability and in China toward other state aims. But here in the UAE, because of the very, um, I think, important and unique political structure you have, you could have a model that is focused on the benefit of humanity, which will be very important as we think about how these models compete. Yeah, most wouldn't make that uh, connection between the benefit of humanity uh, and AI, but I was here during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic living in Abu Dhabi, and they, they saw as a um, small population, you can take a very precise data set yes. and you know, design around it. Do you want to spend a moment, both of you, on why small is good when it comes to AI? because you can do some innovations around your population and then apply it to different sectors. Do you want to go ahead? And sure. We, again, one of the meetings here this morning was talking about um, uh, DNA data and targeted medicine that they're partnering with you with some large pharma companies on for doing targeted RNA uh, med therapies for cancer. This is impossible to do in the U.S. You couldn't do it. I mean, you'd have more lawyers in the room than you have doctors and geneticists. That would for sure happen. Um, but as an example, artificial intelligence can be applied toward creating new medical outcomes in cancer therapy in this particular case uh, that you couldn't do in the U.S. And this is being done for the benefit of the population. Now, will there be some profit to the companies that are involved? Sure. But it goes, but the first question is, are we doing the right thing for the, for the, for the people here, for the population? Are our hospitals the best in the world? How do we create the best therapies? This is people first. Good. Um, so do you, do you want to discuss, Gavin, the partnership here? because people are looking at uh, Valor, if I'm saying it correctly, and uh, treaties uh, management. And 
what would come out of it and what you're looking at to explore here uh, in the UAE. And then I'd like to look at some of the potential uh, innovations that'll come out of the partnership for the UAE. You're not here by accident. You didn't just take a left turn and said, I'm coming to the UAE for no reason. Yeah, um, well, what I would hope is if, if there was a partnership, um, that it would bring a lot of economic value um, and technological innovation know-how to the region um, for the benefit and just the one thing that was just so striking in every meeting we had, how focused everyone was on this must add value to the people of the region. Okay, good. And what does that look like in terms of your partnership, Antonio, and what you hope to do with it? Not just with the UAE, but between the two of you as entities. Uh, oh, so you know, Gavin and I have been thinking very carefully about um, building an, uh, an AI fund together. And part of that AI fund uh, we are considering would be a data center. And we are here in the region discussing that data center. It's one of the things we've been talking about is building a data center here because this region in particular is very, very well positioned to build data centers. Um, and Abu Dhabi, uh, the UAE, uh, is very advanced. We had a wonderful meeting this morning um, with Talal, the, the gentleman who runs uh, G42, and we were, I'd say both of us, blown away by what we heard and how advanced the country is. So, uh, well, this is a great point. I, I, in that course I was talking about at NYU Abu Dhabi, we had Peng Zhao, the CEO of G42, as a guest, and he was explaining some of the strategy and how the government is approaching it uh, today. And then he brought up something you know, that you touched upon very briefly, Antonio, but I think it, for this audience it's worth bringing up. You know, the US and China are competing already on this quite fiercely. Uh, some would say they have different motivations. Uh, the US wants to be a leader because they have Silicon Valley and all these other centers in the US uh, where you're based. Uh, but he said, you know, the UK, and I'm living in London now, was trying to be the regulatory center, and he said something very prescient. He said, you know, China's not going to accept, you know, a Western-led regulatory center, and there's potential here for the UAE for the experimentation. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, to, to build on what Antonio said, you know, one of the spe specific ways that this partnership, if it, if it comes about between us and, and potentially entities in the UAE, would add value is we would use this data center as a test bed and a sandbox to evaluate the most advanced technologies before we invested in them, to have vertical AI applications that would run on this data center um, in the region. But I actually think there is a very important role um, that the UAE can play as a trusted American ally, because the reality is by denying um, China access to the most advanced GPUs, and simultaneously, the most advanced um, semiconductor capital equipment manufacturing um, technologies, we're effectively, America is freezing them in time. And the rest of the world is going to keep moving ahead. Mm. And at some point, this will become, I think, you know, untenable for China. And so I think there is a role to play for access to the most advanced technologies um, in semiconductor design and manufacturing in a data center in the UAE, which is a trusted American ally that can be used for, you know, all of these technologies are dual use. Like I profoundly believe that generative AI is, is dangerous and um, has much of a danger and opportunity to humanity as um, nuclear power. And so, you know, I think the United States is concerned with the military applications, but, you know, we don't want to hold back, I would imagine, America, I don't speak for America, basic science in China. We don't want to hold back drug development. And AI is going to change drug development forever. You know, we've, mm. we've doubled human lifespans with 350 chemical compounds, 150 biologics. That should be in the tens of thousands. And that will be in the tens of thousands because of AI. And I would think the United States wants China using AI for peace, peaceful purposes. And, you know, I think the UAA is very well situated to be a safe provider of those technologies to China. Very interesting. So it could serve as a, it's geographical center, but it could serve as a center for AI. Do you want to, this is fascinating because of this audience, some may know this uh, deeply, some are trying to figure out where we're going. 
Uh, what are your thoughts about the, the UAE position here, not just for your partnership, but for what Gavin was talking about, Antonio? Oh, I, I agree with Gavin. Look, I mean, we are in a, a, a geopolitical world where the strategic competition between the U.S. and China is going to get more intense over this technology. And, you know, the, the, the GCC is a, it's, it's a fulcrum in history, it often has been, and it finds its, itself in that place again. It, it, at some level, having a, uh, a, a place that's safe, um, where the safety is built into the chip, is, and it can be used for civilian, non-militarized uses for all humanity, is great. This is better, better for humanity. Look, I'm wearing my Star Trek socks today, okay? I believe in a Star Trek future. And Say that again? I'm wearing my Star Trek socks. These are Star Trek oh, socks. Star socks. <laughs> I wear Star Trek socks because I am, I, I, there's two futures, right? There's the Terminator future and there's a Star Trek future. It's A or it's B. That's kind of the way we think about the world. And if we're going to be in a Star Trek future, I think we need to collaborate as humans, we, all of us. And this is a place where we can collaborate and these systems are being built here from first principles to allow for this collaboration because the safety of, of, the, of the data is being built into the system. This is very important and I think it's, it's a very deep forethought. Like the, 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 the policymakers here have been thinking about this very deeply for a long time it looks like to us and they have designed it from the beginning to allow many countries to use these systems and safely for all of them. Very good. And you know, I wanted to find out if we can separate you know, the hype from the reality and then I would love to have you talk about talent, what sort of talent you need in a society to support you. But everybody talks about AI and the threat of AI, right? And misinformation that could come. There was a case uh, where the mayor of London, they did a mock-up video in the last 24 hours and he got you know, railed for it. But then we kind of drowned out the potential of it at the same time. So is it overhyped in your view? And then how do we get the balance right to innovate but regulate so society sees the benefits and not the downfalls. Gavin? I think it's profoundly underhyped. I think in six months it will be Im impossible to tell whether content was created by humans and is authentic or AI. Uh, the White House in America just said <coughs> they were going to cryptographically mark every communication from the White House um, in an effort to combat this. I think that's going to be very hard. Um, Something I would actually encourage everyone to do in the audience is to establish a safe word with your, with your family because the technology to create a perfect digital replica of anyone in your family that can FaceTime you and ask for money um, exists and they can say, send me this money and there will be no way for you to know if it is real or not and they'll say, send it in 10 minutes, so make that safe word. But um, the one thing I think we want as human beings, and this is... Uh, what I was heartened by in this discussion um, this morning uh, to learn about Jace in particular as an LLM is we want a world where there are many LLMs. A world where there's one or two dominant AIs is a very risky and potentially unfriendly world for humans. That's the Terminator future. Mm -hmm. The Star Trek future, we want what I would call a multipolar world of AIs where there's many AIs um, and there's diversity in AIs and they are imbued with the values of their creators and in the same way, you know, values have driven a lot of success for different human civilizations. You know, I think that AIs with the right values will be aligned with the civilizations with the right values and, you know, hopefully we all have our own personal AI that mirrors our, our values. Good. Let's follow up on the, the skill sets that are necessary and with the training uh, I've learned a lot even teaching university and dabbling in it uh, for the last few years uh, that there's a mismatch sometimes in universities and what's needed in the private and public sector. Do you want to say what you're looking for, what society needs, Antonio? Have you have given it some thought? No, yes, we have given it some thought. Look, we, we obviously need great programmers and we need them um, in different parts of the world because what Gavin's talking about is important that these are intelligent, there's, that we have a, a, a world where we have a balance of many different uh, models that are creating different languages with different cultures. And they need to be created by people that are local to those cultures. So, you know, I think the, I think the government here is making an effort to not just bring talent in, but develop ta talent locally to develop the models here. And this will be easier to do now than it's ever been because the models themselves will reinforce the development, right? So we can use models to write code, but the people at the very, very top that are writing the code have to understand the local culture and the local values to make sure that the machines are reflective of who they are. 
Oh, very fascinating. Now, there's um, discuss in, at COP28 here in the UAE uh, about you know the pass, passageway to you know uh, climate action. Uh, and there's a view from the global north and then what happens with the global south. They need the financing, they need access to energy to develop. You hear the same thing in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And one of the things that stands out, if we don't get the balance right when we talk about regulation, uh, is to ensure that they are not left behind. There's the cybersecurity threat that's affecting the global south as we speak. How do we make sure that this is given and shared and make sure that the developing world, which is fast growing, high birth rates, great potential, uh, are not left behind. Would you want to jump in on that? Sure. I mean, I, start, I actually started my career working as a, I want to be a development economist and I worked at Goldman Sachs in Latin America. So I, I, I have a little, it's near and dear to my heart. My first language is Spanish and my father from India, near and dear to my heart. Um, the reality is these technologies are very powerful and they're becoming much easier to use. And, and so I wouldn't be surprised if we don't find um, the next great video game is made by a developer that's sitting in India that may have uh, very little technical knowledge, but really understands um, how to really understand what the consumer wants. So giving access is the most important thing to me. I mean, there are lots of smart people around the world, but if they have access, and look, we have a company, SpaceX, which is, has a Starlink system that's providing access around the world. The key here, I think, is not to be deterministic about what the outcome is, but what the opportunity is. These technologies should open opportunity to the you know, six billion people on the planet that don't have it today. Because they can, they can, we can get Starlink, we can move internet around the world, we can give them access to the models, they can use the models themselves, and they can build products and applications on top of these models that will benefit their own societies. Good. Very, very specifically, what AI, what generative AI simply enables, there's no need for humans to write code anymore. Human language is now code. So we just want to make sure that there's you know, models in every language. Yeah. And anyone on planet Earth can now write code. A part-time convenience store worker um, in Tokyo in a couple of days used generative AI tools to build a video game that grossed over $250 million in a few days. $250 million of revenue, probably $150 million of cash profit, a few days of work by a part-time convenience store worker. And this is the power of the human language mm. being code. My last question for both of you, you can do it in 30 seconds. If I fast forward to 2030, uh, what will AI have done in terms of development here, if you get it right? Five years is a long time in this space because we've been talking about it for the last two or three. Go ahead, Gavin. I think what we'll find most surprising is robotics. I think there will be tens perhaps hundreds of millions of humanoid robots with an LLM effectively dropped into them that can interact with humans, help humans, um, work with humans. And this is going to be, everyone is very focused on the impact of AI on knowledge workers. I think there's going to be an immense impact from these humanoid robots. That fast. That fast. That fast. Wow, Antonio? Well, I think Gavin's right, but I'm gonna add, I'll give you something different. Which I think it's nice yeah. to see that partners actually. Yeah, I think I'm, I, I think it was right. Been, uh, enhanced. The, yeah, the I think the impact on biological sciences is going to be extraordinary. It's it, I mean the, on science, uh, uh, biological sciences. Biological. So call it healthcare, but biological sciences that the artificial intelligence enables us to to do exper experiments, theoretical experiments that you would take years in the lab in minutes days, it's extraordinary. So the rate of innovation and, and the speed at which we can actually test is much, much faster, and you'll see this explode in, in medical treatments. I would, I would just say... I think you're talking up there, partner. But. No, no, I would just say, <laughs> I used to think I was going to be part of the last generation of humans that didn't have the option to live a radically extended lifespan. I no longer think this. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if I was too late to the party. No, 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 you're fine. You give us hope. Yeah. We're about the same age, I guess. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, we might live forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's, we have to try to do the right things in the meantime Please. as technology catches up to us. Antonio Gracias and uh, Gavin Baker, nice round of applause and thanks for playing along with the uh, audience. Thank you. Well.